I need a break from renovations and over ambitious projects. So today I'll be making this little LED matrix in the form factor of a simple add-on. Simple add-ons are little PCBs that you can attach to badges. They have a standardized connector. So this is one example. Thanks Brian. Or here this is another LED matrix by Alex, which is even smaller than mine. But this one is monochromatic. I think he even made an RGB one in the meantime. Anyways, back to my contribution to the community. As you might know me already, I rarely finish a project. It was also almost the case with this one as well. I actually designed it and ordered the PCBs five years ago. But back then I had so much going on that I put it in a box and forgot about it. This little 5x5 LED matrix is based off those addressable RGB LEDs. These are SK6805, but these work similar to those you know from the bigger matrices, LED strips and even those chain lights that I used for my ping pong LED wall. They need to be driven by some sort of microcontroller and in that case I'm using the smallest one so far. This is the 80 tiny 10 which is the size of a grain of rice. It might have been a good choice five years ago, but now we got better options that are less limited. The reason I'm reviving this project is because of the pixel pump. I talked about it in the last episode already. Robin who made the pixel pump also made those SMD component magazines. And the cool thing I figured out last time is that the LEDs are kept in the strip and are all oriented the same, which make them way easier to place. Since these LEDs are so tiny, it's actually quite difficult to see how they are oriented. There is a marking on the back, but even this is barely visible. So figuring out the orientation once, labeling the magazine is of great help when trying to place projects like these. Usually you would create a set of magazines with all the components for the current project. But in this case it's only three SMD components. And I only even have two of those 80 tinies. So now with the pixel pump set up, I can be sure of the orientation of the LEDs. What makes it even more difficult is that each LED on the PCB is rotated by 90 degrees compared to the neighbor. This set the reason that we have always four connections per LED and I was only using a two layer PCB here. So actually by rotating the LEDs, the power, the ground and the data lines line up nicely. However, it makes it way more difficult to place by hand. Oh, wait a second. What is this? Shouldn't this pad be connected to VCC? Oh no. We didn't even start yet and there is already the first mishap. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. Oh come on, you can't be serious. Yeah, this happens if you rush projects. Oh well, I have to botch this, so I will skip the last LED for the reflow. Anyways, I got the stencil and the PCBs already 5 years ago from JLCPCB, who is still my sponsor. That's amazing. Since I've been ordering these back then, many things have changed and improved. We got way more options and services. What didn't change is the low price. You can still get the PCBs for $2 and a lead free surface finish. It's 3.30 in this case. And with the stencil for the soda paste, we are at around 10 bucks, which is really cool. But JLC is not only for hobbyists like me. They can also manufacture PCBs up to 20 layers. This is crazy. And currently there is even an offer up to 8 layers for 2 bucks. So if you ever wanted to design PCB coils, this is your chance. But there are also flexible PCBs. The assembly that I've already used in many of my other projects and also plenty of 3D printing and CNC services. So please check them out. Since I already know that I made a mistake on this PCB, I will only assemble a few to test and code a little bit. I'm using bismuth based low temp solder here. I really like the less severe burns that I get during the reflow process. Anyways, I will just use the pixel pump to place the LEDs that are oriented the same way and then turn the whole PCB and continue. The first components are still a little bit janky, but after a little warm up, 
I get faster and more precise. So the two PCBs should be enough for now. I have a reflow oven, but the preheating plate is really cool if you used too much soda paste like me and need to bump around some components into place. I even squeezed a few soda balls from underneath the LEDs. The v scored panels are way easier to separate. We also need the pin header. Before starting to program the AT Tiny, which drives the LED matrix, I wanted to use WLED, so this way I can rule out any errors in the matrix configuration. What I still need is the botch for the last LED, and I also want to connect the LED data pin to the pin header to test first. But this thing is so tiny, there is no way I can solder that without a microscope. Since I moved in last year, I didn't have the time to set up the microscope yet. So that's a good opportunity. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. This should work and we should get better footage as well. As a practice run, we can try to solder one of those LEDs to wires of the thickness of a human hair. Well, that was more difficult than expected. Anyways, I can use WLED to control it now. If you didn't know, WLED is a firmware to control addressable LED strings and matrices. It's super simple to install from the browser. You just need to connect the ESP via USB, install it, set up the Wi-Fi, and there is even a 2D string configuration. The little matrix is 5x5 and serpentine. And oh well, this little LED works! Look at this. It looks amazing. Now I only need to add the bodges to the matrix and try driving that. Fortunately the VCC VI is next to the pad. So I can scratch off the solder mask and solder on a piece of wire. We probably would be able to just bridge it with solder, but I did it like that. Look at the clippers for scale. With the hot air gun I am able to reflow that and push the LED in place, squeezing out the excess solder. Last touch up of the wire with the soldering iron. And we can just add the testing connection between the data pin and the pin header. And oh well, the matrix works! <laughs> yeah. At full brightness it's really hurting my eyes. I don't know how many nits this is, but here is a comparison next to the sun. It's competitive. As a next step I needed to program the AT Tiny 10. I didn't know when I designed it that it's using the tiny programming interface. But I was actually lucky that it's supported by the AVR ISP MK2 that I have seen somewhere here around recently. Ah, here it is. I used the second matrix without the bodges and without the last LED to set up my programming environment here. One stupid thing is that the AVR ISP isn't able to supply the power anymore. I think they changed it at some point. So I have to power it over the pins additionally. I uploaded a simple test sketch, but nothing was happening. And there is where I realized the second mistake. 
It's actually not reset. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. So I have to pull it high with a resistor. Yeah, that works. Oh well, there comes another botch. There's not much space for this botch. But fortunately the reset and VCC pins are next to each other. So soldering on a 0402 resistor is the easiest option. And that works now. So I can start to develop. Yes. The internal oscillator of the AT Tiny runs at 8 MHz. So we have to be careful with the timing to output the 800 kHz data stream. But with some optimized assembly and an unrolled loop for the 24 bits, that's actually possible. But the problem that I'm encountering here as mentioned is the AT Tiny 10 is quite limited. We have 1 kilobyte of flash for the code and data and only 32 bytes SRAM for the stack and the frame buffer. Since we have 25 LEDs, that's only one byte per LED, not the three bytes that we would need. Anyways, after trying a lot, I decided to encode three bits for green and red and two bits for blue. And with all those limitations, actually there is not much possible in the code. However, I tried to squeeze out every last byte that I can get from the flash and decided to scroll a long bitmap through the frame buffer. And it looks really cool! At the end I added a teeny tiny 9 cat. Oh well, the resolution is a little bit limited. The buffer overflow at the end looks like the 9 cat would even move. So this is how you can use controlled bugs as features. Anyways, it's now time to transfer it to the other matrix. I have all the microcontroller pins exposed as pads on the back and thought I can use this pogo pin header to press it on while programming. I soldered it to a pin header to wire it with jumper cables and it actually works! Nice! Yeah. By the way, I'm using here only one eighth of the maximum brightness and it's already hard to film. If you're wondering how bright it is, this is the full brightness wide. After two minutes it's already over 106 degrees C. So probably at some point with the low temp solder the LEDs might fall off. I would consider it a fuse protecting you from burns by disassembling itself. So let's attach it to a badge. Okay, wait a minute. Did I actually mess up the connector? No. What? We don't make mistakes. Shoot. We have happy accidents. <laughs> oh well, this is why you test until the end to find all the errors in your first iteration. Anyways, it looks cool. You can find the code in the description below. I hope you like this little project with all the little mishaps and errors. I had some fun tinkering around with that. If you like more stuff like that, please subscribe. I linked the code in the description, as well as a link to the Pixel Pump and the SMD magazines and some coupon codes for JLC PCB. So please check them out. By the way, if you are interested, next month I'm at the Maker Fair in Hannover and at the Musikkabinett Meetup in Rüdesheim. Great thanks to all my supporters on Patreon, Twitch, YouTube subs, PayPal and GitHub. I see you next time. Bye!